एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन Tonight, done deal. India's Adani Group and John Keels announce receipt of West Container Terminal Letter of Intent for 51% stake. So that's 49, and the note be shared with the government institutions and also the private sector who's interested, who has some experience in this field. Open doors. The government moots guideline changes for vaccinated tourists. Maldives, they have relaxed their guidelines so much, so that it's very competitive for us at the moment. Kamapans. Former Western Province Governor Azad Sali arrested and detained under the PTA for Sharia comments. Under consideration. The government says a reported face veil ban not in force. Burka, Nika, not ban. These are two dresses that are under consideration. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Tuesday, the 16th of March, 2021. Alcohol adango hand sanitizer bavi takaranne. Lady roga ati karanu visha bija valeta erahi vasa tan karanne. Handun vadi me milan rupiah tunse panhai. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Hamza Kekanai. Now, after weeks of uncertainty over the fate of the talks between the Sri Lankan government and India's Adani Group over the development of the Colombo port's West Container Terminal, the Indian port operator has announced the receipt of a letter of intent from the Sri Lanka Ports Authority. The Adani Group will take over the terminal with a reported 51% stake as part of a consortium including Sri Lanka John Keels Holdings PLC with the remaining 49% stake split between the Sri Lanka Ports Authority and other interested local investors. The project is to be undertaken on a 35-year build operate transfer basis with an estimated investment of 750 million US dollars. The 2019 MOU signed between the governments of Sri Lanka, India and Japan for the development of the Colombo port's East Container Terminal stirred up a hornet's nest of protests earlier this year. The fiasco began after Sri Lanka's Minister of Ports announced in November 2020 that the East Container Terminal will be operated as a joint venture between the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, India and Japan with the SLPA retaining a 51% stake. The company expected to represent the Indian side was identified as the Adani Group. the country's largest private port operator after the announcement of the deal port related trade unions throughout the country commenced a work to rule campaign that had the potential to bring the country's economy already hit hard by the pandemic to its knees as a result the government was forced to take a step back much to the disappointment of the indian and japanese governments who were eager to take charge of one of sri lanka's most strategic and commercially lucrative container terminals However the Sri Lankan government shortly after the cancellation of the original agreement submitted another proposal this time for the development of the West Container Terminal to which the response of the Indian and Japanese governments has been somewhat lukewarm the cabinet announcement of the approval of the deal at the beginning of this month mentioned the Adani group as a potential investor Meanwhile the Adani group released a media statement yesterday confirming the deal which confirmed the receipt of a letter of intent from the Ministry of Ports and Shipping acting on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka and pursuant to cabinet approval. The communique revealed that Adani Ports and Special Economic Zones Limited will partner with John Keels Holdings PLC as part of the consortium awarded the mandate. It added that the WCT will be developed on a build operate and transfer basis for a period of 35 years as a public private partnership. Meanwhile the John Keels Group 2 in a stock exchange filing yesterday confirmed its participation as the local partner of Adani Ports and Special Economic Zones Limited. The statement also notified the CSE that the consortium consisting of APSCZ and JKH received a letter of intent from the Ministry of Ports and Shipping and the Sri Lanka Ports Authority. It also announced that a concession agreement is expected to be executed in due course where JKH will have a material equity stake in the project. Meanwhile at today's cabinet media briefing cabinet spokesperson minister Kehri Ramakwelda responded to reports of the Adani group taking a 51% stake in the deal uh, that is the offer that they have made 
the breakdown will be finalized after discussions but i'm sure that there are so many other parties that are interested as a government of sri lanka we are also interested to see whether the local com- local companies are also interested in this entire thing so this is quite open as far as we are concerned we are looking for other options while uh, accepting the adani's uh, 51% With that the minister also confirmed that the balance 49% proposed in the Adani deal will remain open to local investors in partnership with the Sri Lanka Ports Authority so there's 49 and then 49 would be shared with the government institutions uh, that are related to ports and ports management and also the private sector who's interested who has some experience in this field will be considered uh, as far as the Adani is concerned they have expressed that they are willing to bring in 51% of whatever the cost involved so there was uh, i think Uh, details that will be taken subsequently initially in prin- principle we have agreed to uh, work with these uh, companies the percentages are to be decided at a later date sri lanka's best health insurance with the fastest claim settlement soft logic life pay just 500000 rupees to reserve your unit today mulberry residence now a possible ban by the government on all manner of face covering garb in public places including Islamic garments, the burqa and the niqab, has sparked a heavy debate. The subject dominated today's cabinet media briefing as well, with clarifications being sought over the matter. Speaking there, cabinet spokesperson Kehli Rambukwele affirmed that a ban on face covering garb is yet to be imposed and whether to include the burqa and the niqab in the possible ban is currently being deliberated. Minister of Public Security Rear Admiral Dr Sarath Virasekar said on Saturday that he signed the cabinet paper which will see a ban on any face coverings in public places over national security concerns. This will include Islamic garb such as the burqa and the niqab. The matter continues to dominate local and international news platforms with many factions weighing in with their opinions. The Pakistan High Commissioner took to Twitter and said that quote the likely ban on niqab will only serve as injury to the feelings of ordinary Sri Lankan Muslims and Muslims across the globe unquote The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief Ahmad Shaheed also expressed concerns over the proposed ban adding that quote the burqa bans are incompatible with international law guarantees of the right to manifest one's religion or belief or of freedom of expression unquote To date a total of 19 countries have implemented a similar ban on face covering garb in view of national security Within Europe, Switzerland, France and Austria have banned full face coverings as have Belgium, Bulgaria and Denmark. During today's cabinet media briefing, cabinet spokesperson Kehli Rambukwele gave further clarifications on the public security minister's remarks. He categorically said that though a ban on face coverings which would include the burqa and niqab is under consideration, the government is yet to make a decision. on the burqa matter you were saying earlier that uh, the cabinet or the government is not going to rush through this entire process but what was the rationale behind the whole timing i mean bringing this up at this moment especially when uh, the geneva sessions are on as well and we just saw yesterday the pakistan high commissioner also raising concerns about the move no i don't think there's any connection with the geneva sessions with regard to this this is uh, internal security matter and it is not only internal externally also uh, there are enough and more countries who are considering this as a security threat so that is the basis on which we have uh, discussed in this and we will be moving forward towards that on the basis of national security nothing else one of the tamil newspaper yesterday published government is planning to ban the arabic language to learn from age between 5 to 16 not at all there is a serious consultation that's going on with the muslim community and muslim leaders as well as the government this preschool and madrasa it is been taken into consideration and they are discussing about it as to how you can from the age 5 to 16 that you will have the religious school but as far as from there on if you want to specialize on as maulavi is and there is a system that we are trying to evolve and that is in consultation with the muslim leaders and the rest of the people now you said the cabinet is not going to rush we had justice minister saying that the ban is on a burqa and we had the public security minister saying that it's burqa and the niqab so can you give us some clarity on what exactly is the government trying to do the first one is the burqa the other one okay. is the niqab the other one is the hijab as far as the hijab is concerned we are considering the hijab then you have 
other things like the Shailia and Al Amira, these are all accepted, except these two. So basically the, the burqa and the niqab. Yes, hijab is accepted. So basically you're banning no, two. Sweetie. Not banned. These are two dresses that are under consideration whether there is a, any threat to national security. Do you have any information that anyone has actually carried out an attack wearing a burqa? Because the suicide bombers were not wearing burqas, they were having backpacks. So would you also now ban backpacks? Not necessarily because what happens all depends on the intelligence. You don't wait till an uh, incident takes place. That is exactly what happened last time. We are taking precautionary measures. The precautionary measures that amounts to national security in relation to the future activities, that is an assessment that you make. It can be the hijab or it can be a backpack. If that is the case, that will be dealt with. You don't wait till something happens and then say, okay, this is what they owe and then we have to take action. You need to have our pre-planning. Do you have credible intelligence that there is a serious threat of somebody actually wearing a hijab or a niqab to carry out an attack? I cannot tell you exactly, but how we deal with it is in consultation with the intelligence and any possible future uh, activities. Now, former governor of the Western province and leader of the National Unity Front, Azad Sali, was arrested by the Criminal Investigation Department this evening upon instructions of the Attorney General. The former governor stirred up controversy by making a statement recently in which he implied that the country's prevailing law will not apply to the Muslim community. He further said that the Muslim community will only abide by the Sharia law. His statement was met with severe opposition, with many saying that the comments reeked of extremist sentiments. Several factions also filed complaints with the Criminal Investigation Department over Sully's comments. Today, the Attorney General issued instructions to, to the CID to arrest Sully since he has committed an offence under the Penal Code and the Prevention of Terrorism Act and has violated the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights No. 56 of 2007 by making the particular statement. As such, the police said that, this, that Saleh will be detained and interrogated under the provisions of the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Health authorities are expected to issue revised guidelines to enable vaccinated tourists to skip quarantine and the mandatory PCR tests on arrival. Speaking to First at Nine, Director General of the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, Dhammika Vijay Singh, revealed that the revisions will be issued this week and will allow Sri Lanka to regain its competitiveness as some regional tourist hotspots have already relaxed their restrictions. The government has mooted plans to allow tourists who have received the full dosage of the COVID-19 vaccine to enter the country since the strict restrictions, quarantine procedures and the travel bubble. According to a media report, Chief Epidemiologist Dr. Sudat Samarivira had revealed that at a meeting held recently, the Ministry of Tourism has requested health authorities to revise the current health guidelines in line with these requirements. Dr. Samarivira also revealed that some aspects of the health guidelines would be changed in the coming week, including the quarantine process, which will apply to both tourists and Sri Lankan repatriates as well. This is expected to relieve the need for vaccinated arrivals to undergo quarantine and will not entail the mandatory on-arrival PCR test and Class 1 hotel stay until the results are received. Meanwhile, Director General of the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, Dhammika Vijay Singha, says that the revised guidelines can be expected this week. Now we opened the country for tourists on the 21st of January with some restriction. There are a mandatory number of PCR tests to be done. However, uh, when we compare with some other countries like Maldives, they have relaxed their guidelines so much so that it's very competitive for us at the moment. That is why we requested that there should be separate protocols, especially if uh, the tourists are vaccinated, then there should be a separate protocol where they don't have to undergo all these uh, mandatory PCRs and then uh, the quarantine period. And then there was another request from us regarding the mandatory quarantine for hotel staff. So we have put forward this uh, proposals and then the technical subcommittee met uh, even yesterday and they have reviewed our proposals and they will be issuing the revised guideline most probably within this week. Now, Cabinet co-spokesperson Dr. Ramesh Patiran responded today on public fears after the suspension of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in several European countries over reports of possible blood clots. Addressing the Cabinet media briefing this morning, Dr. Patiran has said that the vaccine stocks used in Sri Lanka are not from the batch that has caused the issue. 
Meanwhile, the World Health Organization too confirmed that there remains no concrete evidence that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine causes deadly blood clots. Several European countries, including the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway, banned the use of Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine following reports of several suspected deaths due to blood clots after inoculation. At the heels of this development, Indonesia too delayed the administering of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine, awaiting a review from the World Health Organization. In this backdrop, Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, once more moved to dispel any fears there might be over the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine. Several more countries have suspended the use of AstraZeneca vaccines as a precautionary measure after reports of blood clots in people who had received the vaccine from two batches produced in Europe. This does not necessarily mean these events are linked to vaccination, but it's routine practice to investigate them. And it shows that the surveillance system works and that effective controls are in place. The concerns surrounding AstraZeneca's vaccine was also brought up during the Cabinet media briefing this morning, with Cabinet co-spokesperson Dr. Ramesh Patirana also assuring that the vaccine doses received by Sri Lanka is not linked to the batch of vaccine in question. What's more, Director of the Allergy, Immunology and Cell Biology Unit at the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, Dr. Chandima Jeevandara, meanwhile says that tests conducted on blood samples of those who have been vaccinated show good levels of antibody development against the virus. Dental banka bata and come vaccine a coxed assassinica vaccine, a vaccine a Gahana Kalingapi, the Dahakani Adia, Labagina, the Mim Masak Vervela, Egulangi, Rudra Parishan, Parishakal, Balula, Pita, Itama, Pahadio, Pain Latino, Itamatum Sarta Kalesa, Priti de Gudanagina, Egulangi, I think Kita Hosa Taki can a Sri Lanka can tell me vaccine nicker, Honi Badakarno, Kinakatamai, Eking Adasin, it may vaccine nicker, two dose scheduled like the Mai, the Batkalatin, the Vinimatra, Labagatam, Pasit. Eleven thousand four hundred and eighty-nine people were inoculated against COVID-19 yesterday. That meant by last evening, seven hundred and eighty-four thousand five hundred persons had been administered the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. At the heels of three chosen grades returning to academic activities at schools in the Western Province yesterday, the Department of Buddhist Affairs says that all Dhamma schools in the province will reopen on the 25th of April with adherence to strict health and safety protocols. Meanwhile, 331 infections were reported from the island yesterday. 248 of them were confirmed across 21 districts. The remaining 83 infections were detected among foreign arrivals. The highest number of district-based infections came from Mathura with 49. 34 infections each were reported from Gampaha and Mathale, 28 from Colombo, 13 from Gaul, 11 each from Kaluthara and Kandy, 9 from Norelia, while 8 cases each came from Jaffna and Mulatheu. A further 43 infections were confirmed across 11 other districts. There were no confirmed cases yesterday from the Eastern Province and the Kirinochi district. As for today, 154 infections have been detected in the island so far. In the meantime, five more COVID-19 deaths were reported yesterday. The deceased were identified as residents of Jaffna, Gampaha, Kalambo and Kalutara districts. With the confirmation of two more deaths during the day, the total number of COVID-19 fatalities in the country now stands at 534. COVID-19 recoveries in Sri Lanka is also maintaining good pace, with 402 persons being confirmed to have recovered from the virus today, taking the overall tally to 85,371. It leaves only 2,487 active novel coronavirus cases in the island. 
Now, a parliamentary subcommittee has been appointed to formulate an appropriate methodology to include law as a subject in the school curriculum. The subcommittee had been appointed at a special joint meeting of the Ministerial Consultative Committee on Education and Justice, chaired by Education Minister Professor G. L. Pires and Justice Minister Ali Sabri, recently. The Parliament said that an eight-member parliamentary subcommittee has been appointed to formulate an appropriate methodology to include law as a subject in the school curriculum. Its members include State Minister Susil Premajanta, Parliamentarians Rauf Hakim, S. Sri Dharan, Veera Sumanavira Singha, Sagar Karyavasam, Amarakirti Atukurala, Diana Gamagi and Major Sudarshan Adenipitiya. Assistant Secretary General of Parliament Tikiri K. Jaitilaka has been appointed as the Secretary to the Subcommittee. Minister of Justice Ali Sabri is quoted saying that it is very important to impart a basic understanding of the law to the children of this country as the public knowledge of the law is at a very low level. He had emphasized that steps have been taken to provide citizen education in basic law in the developed countries and that there is an urgent need to incorporate knowledge of law into the school curriculum. Minister of Education Professor G. L. Pires meanwhile has instructed the committee members that the report containing the recommendations be submitted within two months. The Minister of Education added that the subject of law should be included in the curriculum as soon as possible, thereafter on the recommendation of an expert committee. We will see you shortly. Stay with us. Sunlight Kia Naturals, Obey Edo Kia Karai. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha says that the standard operation procedures for production of both vehicles and accessories is a new turning point in the industrial sector of Sri Lanka. Addressing the launch event of the standard operation procedure on production and assembly of vehicles and accessories, the Premier added that the new development opens up many doors for foreign investors to enter the local automobile sector. The launching of the standard operation procedure on production and assembly of vehicles as well as production of vehicle accessories was worked off last evening under the patronage of Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. During the event, the document pertaining to the standard operation procedure was submitted to the Prime Minister by Minister of Industries Vimal Veeravansa. इनसा कोई समगा भारतीय बल पहन आओ बकरन अभी वाहन आने ने लातर करा इम कले काउरवत पीड़ा वाले पद करन नहीं था कि न नहीं वाहन निष्पाद ने क्लास क्रीम हाँ वाहन उपांगनी पदवी में पीली बात सम्मत मेहुम पार्टिया हदान द बहु योजना इधरी बात तूला मैं कार्य मित्रम खड़ी न मिंग करान बुलाऊं वही केला पे काउरवत व Rata sama tak mahu parti parti. Tapi dalam itu, desia, widadesia, orang yang mahu aje juga. Apa yang rata wahana nisbahan sesuatu, visi mereka mahu tadah nirmani. Orang berdasarkan apa yang nanti pulang ke bumi. Ini sah made in Sri Lanka. So istirahatnya sanamnya blisser. Lautan genian, rata khati yang apa yang terbaik dengan kamu. Moving on with other local stories, police have uncovered large sums of money credited from Dubai to an account of a suspect arrested some months ago over a drug offence. They say that some of the monies have been transferred to an account of an extremist organisation. A few months ago, a suspect residing in the area of Kesilvatta in Panadura was arrested by the Paliagoda police over a drug offence. The suspect was then held under detention for questioning. Investigations conducted into the suspect have revealed that large sums of money had been deposited to an account belonging to the suspect from Dubai. Emma Ginumen, Yam Mudal Pramanya, Kinya Pradesh, Sita, Mehevanu Labana, Antavadi, Matadarna, Sangvitaneka, Ginumakata, Baravi Atibata, Turutur Labitibino, Eva Gema Banku Ginum Manua, Sanat Vitibino, Ohu, Yama Karekata, Antavadi, Mata, Prachari Kirima, Eva Gema Sandha, Mudal Sepeima, Yana Karnusam Bandain, Taudruta, Timarshane Kirima Sandha, Ie Dina, Columbus, Astakria, Vimarshana Kotashi Vita, Pali Gota Sita, Ragina Vitibino, Esam Banda Vimarshana Kriat Makovino. In the meantime, the Criminal Investigation Department today arrested the former directors of the Swarna Mahal Jewelers Private Limited, Jivaka Edrisingha, Anjali Edrisingha, Asanka Edrisingha and Nalaka Edrisingha. The arrests were made upon the directions of Attorney General Dapula Dilivera. 
Coordinating Officer of the Attorney General State Council, Nishara Jayaratna, said that the four suspects were arrested on charges of money laundering. We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Bear with us. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, manufacturing in the month of February has shown an improvement due to a number of factors, namely the upcoming seasonal demand, while expectations for the next three months too improved on a gradual normalization of economic activity, both locally and internationally. Further employment has also recorded an improvement due to these factors, especially in the food and beverage subsectors. The February 2021 manufacturing PMI sustained its expansion, recording an index value of 59.4 due to production and new order expansion. Further stock of purchases and employment as well as supplier delivery times also expanded, sustaining the overall manufacturing PMI at an elevated level. Meanwhile, the production sub-index increased as well, especially in food and beverages sector manufacturing, in anticipation of upcoming seasonal demand, while new orders too recorded a high index value. Further, textile and wearing apparel sector manufacturing also recorded healthy index values in new orders and production. In addition, employment also expanded at a higher rate in February, particularly in the food and beverages sector in line with production increases. However, textile and wearing apparel sector employment remained neutral during the month. In the meantime, manufacturing activity expectations in the next three months remain at improved levels in expectation of a normalization of economic activities in Sri Lanka and in major export markets. Further, the services PMI increased to 56.5, indicating a further improvement and was underpinned by expansion observed in new businesses, business activities and activity expectations. New businesses, meanwhile, increased in February 2021 due to observed improvements in the financial services, other personal services and real estate activities subsectors. The transportation and financial services subsectors also showed an improvement with a gradual normalization in economic activity. The Sri Lankan rupee has further depreciated against the US dollar with the selling rate quoted today at 200 rupees and 75 cents. This is the highest selling rate recorded against the US dollar since the 9th of April 2020 and this marks the third time that the selling rate has exceeded the 200 rupee mark. The rupee saw a depreciation of 2.7% within the period of three months. When contacted, State Minister of Money and Capital Markets and State Enterprise Reforms Ajit Nimad Cabral assured that the rupee depreciation will only last a few days and will appreciate soon after. Now let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies during the day. Meanwhile, at the Colombo Bourse, Sri Lankan shares ended lower today, dragged down by losses in industrial and consumer staple stocks, with the all share price index closing at closing at 0.57% lower at 7,119.7. With that, the SP SL20 index of more liquid stocks also fell 0.6% or 17.3 points to close at 2,845.51. Now, here's Dimantha Matthew with a brief report on today's market performance. We are seeing a red Tuesday for the seventh consecutive week today and today the market is down by around 40 points. Now the market has come down to around 7,120 levels. We feel that the stabilization phase is slow but still there seems to be a lot of selling pressure in the market specifically in the retail favorite counters. On the positive rounds we are continuing to see buying interest on selected segments specifically in the banking sector and capital goods sector. Overall turnover slightly improved to 1.2 billion another positive sign and the number of transactions also have improved close to 15,000 transactions. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.